Turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 19. We're going to look, we're going to start in verses 25 through 27. We're going to talk about compassion from the cross. And Mother's Day is one of those days that is, it's an interesting time to be a preacher because uh, across your congregation, you have a whole group of people who've had different experiences. Uh, Some can come and, and, uh, be joyful and, and excited and burst with pride and others are in, in fear and sorrow uh, about uh, you're just kind of the unknown not knowing what's going on with children and all that then we have uh, ladies in our church who although they were never a mother maybe they've been a stepmother or they were the aunt that stood in the gap or the older sister that stood in the gap and so uh, you recognize that and you try to to, to see all that and and uh, to, to be inclusive of what that means. And, uh, and also I think it's interesting that this week when the actual thought of motherhood uh, uh, has been under attack, uh, and uh, I, I don't like to get into, uh, uh, I, I don't like to get into political, the political realm but I do not think that the issue of abortion is a political issue. I think it's a moral issue. Uh, and uh, it has been my feeling uh, for many years that there's no difference in this and the offering of children to uh, the idols of uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians. So that's, that's where I stand on that. But I, I was looking at this passage, and we went. it goes back to the cross. We've been in John, and... We've got two more, actually two more passages to go through to complete the book. But today, uh, I want to go back and look at this because it's Jesus having compassion and caring for his mother uh, from the cross. And, uh, and I, the other thing is it points out the significance of the women who are part of that entourage, who uh, took care of and made sure that things were in place for the disciples and for Jesus to minister and uh, so we're going to look at a few passages there. And, uh, but what stood out to me was in the middle of the anguish and the full brunt of the sin of the world, he took the time to make sure that his mother was cared for. And so as we look at this in John chapter 19, verse 25 through 27, he says, Standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple he loved standing there, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to that disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her in to his home. So uh, from that time on, Mary was under the care of John, that John's home was Mary's home, that he watched after her on that. Now, I want to look at a parallel passage on this in Matthew chapter 27, verse 55 and 56. It's, it's also at the cross. It says, Many women who had followed Jesus from Galilee and ministered to him were there, looking on from a distance. And among them were Mary, Mary the mother of James, and the mother of sons. And there were also, uh, in Mark chapter 15, verse 40, there were also women looking on from a distance. And among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger and of Joseph, and Salome. Now you might recognize that name Salome for as being one who went to the, the garden uh, uh, or went to the, the tomb on the, the day of the resurrection. Uh, And so uh, we, we see uh, uh, in each of these similar lists. I want you to go look at Luke 23, verse 44 through 46. It was now about noon, and this again is at the crucifixion, and darkness came over the whole land until three, because the sun's light failed. The curtain of the sanctuary was split down the middle, and Jesus called out with a, a loud voice, Father, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Saying this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what happened, he began to glorify God, saying, This man really is righteous, or it really was the Son of God. And all the crowds that had gathered for the spectacle, when they saw what they had taken place, went home, striking their chests. 
that they, uh, they knew that something wrong, something uh, uh, not right had happened there. They were beating their chests on it, that there was a, a feeling of guilt and shame. But all who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. And so uh, they, they were there at the cross. And so as we look at uh, this, the women named, uh, you could make a case that there are four or five, depending upon the commentator or the, the person you read. Obviously, the, the, main, the main character there is Mary, the mother of Jesus, that she's listed. And Mary Magdalene is listed in all of those. But now the other, the other Mary, which is, that's kind of a thing. Oh, the other Mary, uh, uh, the, the wife of Clopas. Now, Clopas is a uh, variant of Alpha, Alphaeus, and so James the Apostle uh, was James, the son of Alphaeus, and so he was called the mother of James the Younger. Uh, if you have some older texts, they would call him James the Lesser, but that's kind of a change in, in, in uh, language. That we don't use lesser now, we use younger. And, and so, and then it has listed the sister of Mary, and by name, they have listed Salome. Now, there are some who believe that the sister of Mary is Salome. But there are others that say, no, there, there's a sister of Mary, and then there was Salome. If Salome is the sister of Mary, we know that she is the mother of the sons of Zebedee, who would be James and John, the apostles, the sons of thunder. And so John, the author of this, uh, would be the cousin of Jesus. Now, why does that matter? It doesn't. I mean, it's not going to change your theology, but it's just an interesting thing to look at, at, at that how close-knit this group was. But we see this. Uh, primarily, we want to focus on Jesus' interaction with his mother. And I want you to think about Mary, the mother of Jesus, she was warned, warned early on that this was coming. Now, she had all the blessings from the angels. But when she went to the temple in Luke chapter 2, uh, Simeon blessed them. But he gave this blessing and warning all wrapped in one in chapter 2, verse 34 and 35. Then Simeon blessed them and told his mother Mary, Indeed, this child is destined to cause the fall and the rise of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be opposed, and a sword will pierce your own soul, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. I want you to think about uh, just looking at uh, what she was witnessing. She was witnessing her son, proclaimed by angels, brought about by miraculous. She'd seen him do all these things. Her understanding had been just completely changed about life in this world. And she's there watching him being humiliated and slowly murdered. And she's there uh, on that. And so you think about how that had to sear her heart. But you know what? I, I know uh, f from personal experience that uh, uh, that continues to happen today. I was blessed with a godly mother. She, uh, her sister said, oh, yeah, she never did anything wrong, you know, and, and that was just, uh, she was just that, and, and, uh, and I remember she could not understand why we, her children, would choose to do wrong. It did not make sense to her, but you know what I also remembered? I remember it hurt her that we would choose to do wrong. Uh, and so, uh, as I was thinking about that, you know, at Mary's, uh, Mary's heart was pierced as she saw her innocent son being crucified. But a, a lot of mothers' hearts are pierced because they're watching their children turn their back on God, turn their back on life, turn their back on the way. And, and it's a struggle. Uh, and so... I, I know that there are people here this morning whose hearts are pierced on a regular basis. That you desire for your children uh, to be free from addiction, to be in a right relationship with Jesus, uh, to, uh, to be where they're supposed to be and, and who God's called them to be. And I know that that's a heavy burden. 
I think it's interesting that in the midst of her despair, Jesus took the time to care for her. He took the time to care for her. As we go and we look, he was selflessly caring from the cross. He entrusted the care of his mother to John the Apostle. Now, he didn't put this on his half-brothers because they weren't believers yet. Only trusted those who believed. He was selfless in suffering. He was true to God's Word. And I believe today that He does that for you and I. That there's the hope of restoration of relationships. And there's the hope of wholeness and healing in families. And there's the hope of wholeness and healing in lives. That there's the hope of deliverance and overcoming. And our hope is in Christ Jesus. Now sometimes, uh, let's be frank, we would prefer that Jesus had more of a microwave timetable than an eternal timetable. Right? I mean, I remember when I was a little kid, when we had popcorn, it was a big ordeal. They got the kettle out, they heated the oil, they did all that. All right, hey, you know, and now we throw the bag in there, and at 45 seconds, we're going, come on, come on, come on, come on, right? And we want that, you know, Jesus. In my life, I've had to, I've had to pray the prayer, Lord, if there, my prayer is that they will be restored to you. And if that happens in my lifetime, then that's grand and glorious, and I will be thankful. But if it does not happen in my lifetime, as long as they return to you, that's all I care about. Because I would rather have eternity in heaven than 20 years here. And, and so Jesus reached out and, and he took care of her in the midst of his suffering. He's got the weight of the world. He's bearing the sin of the whole world. He cries out, Father, you've forsaken me. I'm here alone bearing this cross, bearing this sin. And in the midst of that, he, he looks and he says, John, take care of my mom. What a powerful thing. Well, you know why he did that? Because Jesus is always true to the Word of God, right? The Word of God is through the Word of God. Well, take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 16. What does it say? Honor your father and your mother as the Lord has commanded you. Honor your father. What did he do? He carried out the commandments of God even from the cross. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, so you may live long, and so you may prosper in the land the Lord is giving you. Now, you're saying, yeah, but he's getting ready to die. But yeah, he was also getting ready to, to resurrect. And eternity is a pretty good lifespan. Right? You think about it. Eternal life, is a, that's, a, that's a good lifespan. The other thing I'd like to show you is this, is John's response to this. First of all, he honored the Lord Jesus. It says... He ought to be, how did he do that? Because he honored the mother of Jesus. He provided for her well-being. If you go back through history, from what we can tell and, and, and understand, John remained in Judea or Palestine until after the death of Mary, the mother of Jesus. That his primary ministry would have been there in Judea, in that same region where they had grown up in. Now, we, we do see that he begins to travel later in his life, and uh, later on he ends up in Ephesus uh, in Asia Minor, southern Turkey, and he, where uh, he began to write uh, in the AD. And so uh, it, it's interesting that as we look at the Gospel of John, the three Johns, the Revelation, these are written by a man who has had a lifetime of experience but can vividly recount something that happened 60 years earlier. Some went to India. Some went to Africa. Some went to Asia Minor. Some went to Crete. Some went, went uh, here. I mean, John stayed there and ministered faithfully 
providing for the mother of Jesus. Which leads me to say this, on Mother's Day, my thought is, uh, I want to honor my mother. My mother passed away in 2004. Um, uh, what, three days before our wedding anniversary, I think. All I know is we celebrated our wedding anniversary in the Tulsa International Airport after we got out, got from Spokane. And uh, the best way that I can honor my mom the best way that we can honor our parents is to be people of faith. But you might say, well, you know, my, my mom wasn't a, my mom wasn't a believer. You might have a different I'm sure you had a different experience than me in some way. But you know what? Even if they weren't or aren't believers, the best way that you can is to live for Jesus and honor. Because in doing that, in doing that, you, you'll bring honor to her by living the life God called you to live. And so I think about it. Uh, I this time of year I think about my mom. I think about Tony's mom, and. Uh, and I think about, uh, you know, what are we doing? Would they, would they be honored in the life that we live? I guarantee you that if you're true to the Word and you're true to Jesus, that's the greatest honor you can give your parents. Whether they're believers or not, you being a believer in Jesus Christ and living it and, and breathing it, that's a great honor. It brings joy. I'm still motivated by that. I, I, I want to honor my parents' faith. A and uh, I want to be honorable in the way that I live for Jesus. My desire is that we as a church would have that same feeling. That we want to honor our parents by honoring our God. And that God would use us in that way. And I also pray that for many of us that the heartache and the heartbreak will be soothed and calmed and there will be restoration and healing. Because I know our heart's desire is that our children uh, are reunited. Well, we want them to be reunited with us, but uh, most importantly, we want them to be reunited with Jesus. And I pray for that as well. So, in closing, and I don't really have a good way to close this. Happy Mother's Day sounds kind of trite at this point. Let's just say this. May this day be blessed with the grace of God poured out on your life in the way that you need it today. Whether that's in comfort, whether that's in joy, whatever, God, whatever you need. I pray that God's grace will fill that today.